This sermon is brought to you by Christ Church South Philadelphia, a church that is committed to living out the gospel in their neighborhood and from there impacting the world. For more information about our church or to support our mission, you can go to www.ChristChurchSouthPhilly.org. Well, it's good to be with you this morning and to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you yet, my name is Jeff, and it's my joy to be one of the pastors here at Christ Church. Uh, this morning, our preaching is going to come from the book of Judges, the book of Judges. So if you have a Bible with you, you can open to the book of Judges. If you do not have a Bible with you, we'd love to give one to you. So you can just raise your hand up in the air, uh, and we'd love to get one to you. So um, thank you for doing that. We are currently in a series where we're going through this book, uh, which you can find by just looking at the table of contents in the front. That'll direct you to where it is. It's about seven books in. And we're in the series about, about these Judges. And when we're thinking about judges, we're not meant to picture people in black gowns with a gavel. No, these judges are rescuers sent by God to deliver God's people from the trouble that they keep finding themselves in due to their own sin. This morning we're going to be in the third chapter of this letter, so please open to Judges chapter 3. And as you find your way there, many moons ago when I was in college... I used to be part of a team that led a group of high school boys, and we would do Bible studies with them and just you know, pour into their lives, invest in them, disciple them, and try to build memories. Now, in our thinking, the best way to build memories was to create terrifying experiences uh, that then we could bond in the trauma that we shared together over that. Uh, and so we do all kinds of crazy things, and I'll be honest, me and my friends, we were just a walking liability waiting to happen. Um, but one of the things we did was we had all the high school boys come over to this pool, and we set up a big projector screen, and everyone had to sit in the pool in an inner tube, and we watched the movie Jaws together. And the rule was your feet had to stay in the pool the entire time. It's actually a pretty common thing to do. We were not the first people to come up with this idea, but we added a little twist. One of the leaders who had called out sick for the event was in fact not sick. But what he did was about the movie, it was about halfway through after the shark had already attacked and eaten some people, um, and so everyone's feeling a little, you know, a little some type of way with their feet in the water. Um, this leader, who wasn't supposed to be there, climbed a fence, which everyone's backs were turned to, and slowly and quietly got into the water and just as the next shark attack came, he began to swim under these boys' feet and just bump them. And let me tell you, these high schoolers started screaming like they'd never been through puberty. Um, it was unbelievable. And they, 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 were, they were too scared to, like, jump out of their inner tubes and, like, try to swim for, the, for safety on the side. Because, like, who knows what's down there. So, they, like, these big football players, they're just, like, paddling in their inner tubes as fast as they can. And uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a wild scene. But one of my favorite lines in that movie is when the police captain sees the shark for the first time. He, he sees what they're up against, and he says, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. Well, as we come to Judges chapter 3, we're going to meet three rescuers who God sends to deliver his people from their troubles. Each of these rescuers are different from one another, but God uses each to bring a powerful salvation to his people, and yet their rescue doesn't last. Because they all run up against the same enemy that they can't defeat. And so the cycle of people's troubles just repeat itself again and again. And the people of Israel are never able to occupy the 300,000 square miles of land that God had promised them. They, they missed out on the fullness of all that God had for them because of their continual sin against them, against the Lord. And so as miraculous as these saviors were, I think the point of these stories is to show us that what, in what they were up against, they needed a bigger savior. <laughs> what they were up against was too great for any one of them. They needed a bigger savior. And I think sometimes the same can be true for us. As we can get caught in our own cycles, as we try our best to, to get better, but we keep failing, I think sometimes there are ways that we can limit our belief in the work of Jesus, and therefore not live in all of the goodness and all the fullness of who he is for us. I think we need sometimes a bigger view of our Savior. And so my title for this morning and the big idea that I hope 
this text drives home into our hearts is that we need a bigger Savior. We need a bigger Savior, and the good news is is that we have one in Christ. We're going to read Judges chapter 3, verses 7 through verse 31. This is a long passage, so stay with me. Uh, It's also a crazy passage, just to let you know up front. Um, But I believe God can meet us in profound ways in the crazy. So let's turn our attention to the reading of God's word. Judges chapter 3, verse 7. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathane, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rishathane eight years. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, son of Kenez, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord was upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war. And the Lord gave Kishon Rishathing, king of Mesopotamia, into his hands. And his hand prevailed over Kishon Rishathing. So the land had rest 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenez, died. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms, and the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab, and Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly. And the dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came. When they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. They waited till they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sarah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hands. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites, and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel. And the land had rest for 80 years. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with Ignaxgod, and he also saved Israel. Praise God for his holy word, even when we don't understand what's going on in it. Let's bow our heads and pray that God would speak to us through this chapter. Why don't you just bow your head and pray that your heart would be open to what the Lord has to say to you. Just take a moment between you and God. Now, would you please pray also for me, that I would be empowered by God to speak in a way that is helpful to you and honoring to him. God, thank you for your word. 
for what you did through this portion of history and for how you have preserved it throughout history to meet us in this moment now of our history. I pray you would make it come alive to our hearts. You would speak to us what you would have to say to us through it. I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit, a far better sermon might be heard than the one I'm actually going to preach. I pray this, Lord God, so that these people here might be edified, so that your name might be glorified, and so that your enemies might be horrified. Praise the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. So how I want to work through the text this morning is by looking at each of these judges' stories and seeing the lessons that we can learn from them. And then we're going to see how these stories aren't really just about lessons we can learn from them, but how they're really pointing us to someone who is greater than them. So this morning we're going to look at the ordinary Savior, Othniel, the challenged Savior, Ehud, and then the unlikely Savior, Shamgar. So first, the ordinary Savior, Othniel. Othniel is identified as the son of Kenez. We're told in verse 9 that Kenez is Caleb's younger brother. Now everyone in Israel knew who Caleb was. Caleb was a rock star. When the people of Israel first came to the promised land, their leader Moses sent 12 spies into the land to see what was going on there. Those 12 spies come back and 10 of them say, we can't go, we can't go down in there. I know God's promised that land to us, but man, there are giants in that place, and so we can't go fight those people. But two of the men believed the promise of God more than the danger they saw in front of them. These two men were Joshua and Caleb, and they said, hey, it doesn't matter who's in the land. If God has given this to us, we can trust the Lord, and so we need to go in and fight. And so Joshua and Caleb were men of faith. They were men of valor. They were men who were true to the Lord. And after Moses, is, Moses dies, Joshua becomes the leader of the people of Israel, and Caleb becomes his right-hand man. Number two out of thousands and thousands of people that were the people of Israel. And so that's who Caleb was. Kenez is his younger brother, and we're not really told anything else about him except that. There are no great feats of Kenez recounted, no accomplishments Listed. He's just living in his brother's shadow. He is Caleb's brother and he's his younger brother. Back then in ancient times, birth order meant a lot. It was the elder brother who was given the land. It was the elder brother who was given the responsibility to lead the family and the honor of doing so. The younger brother, well, he was just kept around as kind of a backup in case the older brother, who really mattered, died. And so I don't mean to offend any younger brothers here, just trying to set some cultural context. Uh, don't worry, younger brothers, you are all special in God's eyes. Um, but back then, you would not have mattered all that much. Kinez does not matter all that much. What, what, what this is signaling is that Kinez is a nobody. Just lives in his more famous brother's shadow without much to do. And Othniel is his son. He's the son of of a nobody. This set is setting up, this text is setting up for us that he's, he's just an ordinary guy. He doesn't come from anything special. But it is this ordinary man who God uses to step forward in obedience to what God had called him to do, and through this ordinary man, God brings about a powerful victory. But notice, this victory also comes about in actually a pretty ordinary way. The, the other two stories that we read of Ehud and Shamgar, they're actually kind of wild. We're going to get to them in a minute. Like, what on earth is going on there? But often our story is pretty actually straightforward. Verse 10 says, The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He judged Israel. He went out to war. The Lord gave Kishon Rishathain, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And he prevailed over Kishon Rishathain. And besides that, like, really long name, um, that yes, I did practice in my mirror trying to say, um, you know, besides that really long name, there's, like, not much going on in that passage. He went out to war, and he won the war. I mean, really, what's, what's so remarkable about Othniel's story is how unremarkable it is. He just did what God told him to do. But God gave an extraordinary victory through this ordinary man. And so this is what I think we need to see in this. We live in a celebrity-crazed culture. We are preconditioned to think that it's only the people who are rich and famous can be the ones that can do amazing things. 
things. And so we need to see stories like this and be reminded that God loves to use ordinary people like us to do his extraordinary work. The God who made all things with the word of his power, the God who spoke existence into existence, he does not need extraordinary people in order to get his work done. No, what he wants is just faithful people taking ordinary steps of faithfulness to do God's powerful work. God works through ordinary people like Othniel. He also works through the second Savior that we see through challenged people like Ehud. Let's let's look at the challenged people. Savior. We're told in verse 11 that after Othniel dies, the people go back to their wicked ways, and as a result, they're once again conquered by their enemies. So God raises up Ehud to save them. And verse 15 tells us that Ehud was a left-handed man. But the word there in the Hebrew for left-handed actually means withered or impeded. And so really what this is saying in the original language is that the reason that Ehud is left-handed is because his right hand was withered or impeded. He was not a natural lefty. He was made a lefty by a disability. And that actually explains why this king was not scared to be alone with him in private. Normally, a king would never allow anyone into his presence without his bodyguard there. But this king takes one look at Ehud, and he's like, what can this disabled man do to me? Commentary Michael Wilcock says it this way, If Ehud cannot wield a weapon in his right hand, all assume that he cannot wield a weapon at all. This is why he is admitted to the presence of the king when asked for a private audience with Eglion. Because of his deformity, he presents no security risk to the Moabite. Ehud had some challenges. Yet God used Ehud's disability to bring him into close proximity to the king. In God's hands, Ehud's disability was not a liability. It was an accent through which God was working. And so after the bodyguards leave, Ehud takes a hidden sword that apparently he wasn't even searched for because he looked so handicapped. He takes this hidden sword and he takes it and he thrusts it into the unsuspecting king's Belly, and we're told at that moment that when he did so, the food that was in the king came out of the king. Why is that detail included? Well, certainly not just to make us snicker. It's actually a vital part of Ehud's success. Because after killing the king, Ehud has to make his escape. If Ehud doesn't escape, then he can't go and muster together the people of Israel and lead them to victory. If Ehud can't escape, then then killing this king doesn't accomplish all that much. And so normally what would have happened is, man, you know, this guy Ehud's in there for a while. Like, maybe something's going on. Normally the bodyguards would would have got suspicious for a meeting that was taking so long. And so they would have come in and they would have quickly discovered what happened. And they would have been able to overcome and capture Ehud. But because what was inside the king had come out of the king... Because when the bodyguards came to the door, and they're like, I don't hear any movement, but they must have smelled a movement, if you're following me, they don't go in, because they don't want to interrupt the king while he is on his toilet throne. They they don't go in because they think the king is, as they say, relieving himself. And so they delay, and in their delay, Ehud is able to escape. And I love just, again, some of the small details here that God inspired this writer to include. It, it, look where it says, Ehud, as he's escaping, it says in verse 26 that as he escapes, put the wrong way here, as he escapes, he passed by the idols and escaped to Sira. Notice it says he passed by the idols. What had gotten Israel in trouble in the first place? They had been worshiping these false idols. Israel had abandoned the true God because they thought that these false idols were more powerful than their God. But what we're showing here is Ehud is running past these false idols after he had just killed their king. He's running past these false idols, and these false idols can't do nothing to stop the servant of the true king. And from that, Ehud's victory becomes, in the palace, becomes a platform for him to bring together the army, and they go and they defeat their Moabite oppressors. 
And again, notice the details that are included here in verse 29. It says they killed at that one time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. Do you see what this is setting up for us? It is the man with a disability who leads God's people to victory against these strong, able-bodied men. You see, not only can God use the ordinary, God can use, also use those with a deformity. And we got to hear this too because we live in a culture that not only celebrates celebrities, we, we worship strength. We worship strength. Only the strong survive. Right? i got to be strong. I can't show any kind of weakness. And that thinking in our culture filters down into the church. And we can assume that God's victory means that we're going to be these strong people. God's victory means that he's going to take away from us that which makes us weak. But here we see God never healed Ehud from his deformity. God did not grow back his withered hand. No, God left that in his life because that which made Ehud weak was also that which was going to show how strong God was. God did not heal Ehud from his weakness. No, he used Ehud in his weakness. God does not need celebrities and he does not need strong people. He just wants obedient people who are willing to step out in our neediness, step out in our dependence, step out in our weaknesses. And take steps of obedience to do what he's called us to do. He works through ordinary people like Othniel. He works through people with challenges like Ehud. And he works through people who are unlikely, like Shamgar. It's the third savior, the unlikely savior. Shamgar gets the least amount of press in this entire book. He gets one verse. That's all he has in this entire, entire book. We're told almost nothing about him other than he is the son of Anath, which is actually very important to note. Because Anath was the name of a Canaanite goddess, so a non-Israelite name. Shamgar is also a non-Israelite name. And so as we see, the identity of Shamgar is obscure. The only scholarly agreement is that Shamgar, son of Anath, was not an Israelite. So Shamgar is an unlikely, unlikely savior for Israel because he's not even from Israel. We're not told why he cared about Israel. We're not told why he fought for their freedom. We're not told much about him other than that he's a very unlikely savior who saves in a very unlikely way. He saves by taking an ox goad. An ox goad was not a warrior's weapon. An ox goad was a farmer's tool. It was was a long seven-foot pole that had a pointy end on one side of it that you would use to kind of prod cattle to get them to go where you wanted them to go. You know, in our culture, we'll say things like, You don't show up to a gunfight with a knife, you know, not that we should show up to any kind of fight, right? But like, you don't show up to a gunfight with a knife. Well, well, back in ancient times, you don't show up to a sword fight with a wooden stick. But I love how the commentary Matthew Henry puts it when he writes, It is no matter how weak the weapons, if God directs and strengthens the arm. You see, the farmer's tools did something that no weapon could possibly ever accomplish. And through God's power, he strengthened the arm that was wielding this tool. And 600 Philistines fell at the feet of this unlikely Savior who is using a very unlikely weapon. Shamgar did not have a sword. He had very limited resources. But instead of being held back by what he didn't have, he stepped forward and was obedient to God to do what God had told him to do with what he did have. So often I think we can feel like our lack of resources keep us back from what God has called us to do. And so we put off knowing what God wants us to do because we're waiting for some more resources, whatever we think they are, to build ourselves up. So that then, then I'll, I'll follow God when I get this. I'll follow God after I accomplish this. I'll share the gospel after I take this class on how to share the gospel. I'll start giving to the church when I, when, you know, I, I get a job and get, 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 get a little bit more money. I'll start praying more with other Christians and encouraging them and speaking life into one another once I grow up a little bit more in my spiritual maturity. I mean, there's all kinds of things that God calls us to do in Scripture, and so often we don't step into them. We put them off till later because we just don't feel like we have the resources in ourselves to do it. 
And so other people can do those things. Other people should do those things. Those are good things to do, but that's not just us yet. But friends, God does not limit us to the resources that we think we need. If he can work through a non-Israelite to save Israel through a farmer's tool, then can he work through you and me in the limited resources that we think we have? Listen, friends, I just really want you to hear me on this. You do not need anything else to be used by God other than what you have right now. If you needed something else other than what you have right now, God would make sure you have it. And so maybe in the future you'll need something else. Maybe you need to be preparing. This is not like an excuse to to not learn. This is not an excuse to be lazy. No, you need to continue to invest in yourself for sure. But if God wanted you to have whatever that thing is that you think you need to have, if if he wanted you to have it now, you'd have it now. If If he thought you needed it now, you would have it now. But you have everything you need to be obedient to do what God has called you to do today. You have everything you need today. If you need something more tomorrow, God will make sure you have it tomorrow. But God can work through our limited resources to empower faithful obediences. And so these stories, friends, they're they're meant to give us hope that if God can use ordinary people like Othniel, challenged people like Ehud, and unlikely people like Shamgard, then certainly he can use people like us. And yet, there's a theme that gets repeated in each of these guys' stories that shows that we need more than just learning to be faithful like them. Did did you notice how none of these victories last after they die? Othniel wins a great victory. The people have rest for 40 years, but then he dies. And the people return to their wicked ways. And so God has to raise up Ehud. And he has a great victory, and the people then have rest for 80 years. But then he dies. And so Shamgar has to come on the scene. This is the pattern in the whole book of Judges. We were actually exposed to this pattern in chapter 2 when it said this in verse 18. It says, Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. The Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. That, that, that's the whole cycle of the book of Judges. Right? The people serve false gods. They get oppressed by their enemies. They're delivered by a judge. They follow God as long as the judge is alive. Because when the judge is alive, the people know they have a champion. Right? So they don't fear their enemies, but they live in the freedom that their judge had won for them. It says that, that when the judge was alive, the land had rest. That word rest doesn't mean like they're just sleeping in on a Sunday. No, it means that they are content and satisfied. They have shalom, which is whole-souled peace. Think thriving and fullness. These are people who are, who are enjoying the goodness of God. That, that's biblical rest. But when the judge died, they would stop trusting in God. And they would start giving themselves to the worship of false gods. They would begin to adopt the pagan practices of the nations around them. And as a result, they would lose their rest in the Lord. And they would end up enslaved and oppressed all over again. And so these judges could bring a temporary freedom because they could be strengthened by God to kill the Canaanites, to kill the Moabites, to kill the Philistines. But their victories were never final because they could not kill death. They all died, and in their death, the freedom they had fought for was lost. And so ultimately, what this passage is telling us is that we need a Savior who is bigger than death. We need a rescuer. We need a judge who won't die and therefore can lead us into a rest that can't be Lost And friends, that is what we have in Christ, is it not? You see, Jesus came, and he was ordinary like Othniel. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us that Jesus had no form or beauty that naturally drew people to him. If you saw Jesus in a crowd, you could not pick him out of that crowd. He was ordinary like 
Othniel, and he made himself weak like Ehud, not with a physical deformity, but by emptying himself of his divine power and allowing himself to be executed on the cross. And it is the cross where God uses an instrument more unlikely than an ox goad to crush and defeat his enemies. For it's at the cross where Jesus goes into death and suffers the punishment of death for any who would believe in him. He goes into death, but he does not stay dead. No, after lying in the grave for three days, Jesus takes back his life, having defeated death. He walks out of the tomb, folding up his grave clothes, leaving them behind because his work is done. And he has triumphed over sin, Satan, and death. And so unlike Othniel and Ehud and Shamgar, whose victory faded when they died, we have a Savior who says to us in Revelation 1.18, I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. Friends, every day that we wake up is a day that we are living in a reality that we have a Savior who is alive. And that's not just something to celebrate on Easter once a year. That's a reality that changes each and every moment of our lives. Because what the resurrection of Jesus means, it means that the freedom that he fought for and won is the freedom that we now get to live in each and every day. Because our Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's His victory, but who's it give it, He give it to? He gives us His victory. You see, just like these judges won a victory for the people so that people could live in freedom, we have a greater judge who has won an even greater victory over sin, Satan, and death. And we get to live in the goodness and freedom of his victory every day of our lives. In other words, what does this mean? Like street level. What does this mean when you leave here this afternoon and once again you feel tempted to turn from the goodness of God and to pursue other things? What does this mean when those moments come? This is what this means as Romans chapter 6 verses 10 through 12 tell us. This is what the resurrection of Christ means like at 1 o'clock this afternoon. (laughs) It means the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Friends, here's what the resurrection of Christ means for us. It means that while sin is still present in us, because of his victory, its reign over us has been broken. Sin is still present in us, but Jesus has broken its power in us. And therefore, through what he has done, we are not to let it reign in our bodies anymore. Why? Because its reign is a lie. We have a Savior who reigns. We have a Savior who lives. Therefore, we are not to live as captives to our sin. We are instead to believe in the victory of our Savior. And through his power, we are to trust that God can work in us and change us. Through the power of Christ, We can say no to temptation when it comes our way. And we can say yes to the greater joy of obedience to God. Now many parts of the Bible, like Romans chapter 7, 1 John 1, 9, just to make a few, make it clear that we should never expect to be sinless. We should never expect to be sinless. The presence of sin will remain in our lives as long as we live in this sin-cursed world. We should never expect to be sinless. But, Scripture also makes it clear that through the power of Christ, while we will never be sinless, we can grow in sinning less. And through that, experience more of the rest that Christ has won for us. And I just want to level with you, I think we miss this a lot as Christians. I'm part of churches for a long time. I think churches love to talk about forgiveness of sins. 
but I'm not sure we talk that much and that often about the ability God's given us to fight and defeat our sins. I think in many ways we can settle for half a gospel. We sell for a gospel that forgives us, but not one that empowers us. We sell for a gospel that believes God will welcome us in heaven, but not one that believes God can move in us here on earth. We sell for a gospel that removes our shame, glory and hallelujah, but we, we don't believe they can actually break our shackles. And so as a result, we miss out on the fullness of the rest that Christ has won for us and he wants us to experience right here and right now. Now that doesn't mean that there are not battles that we are to consistently fight. Talking about living in the freedom of Christ doesn't mean that we are free from the fight against our sin. No, it means that he has freed us in his power to fight our sin. We're not freed from the fight, we're freed to fight. Right? Think about again about where we're at in the book of Judges. God promised victory to the Israelites when they came to the promised land. God had broken their enemy's power, but the presence of their enemies still remained. And so the Israelites weren't freed from the fight, they were freed to fight. To fight by trusting that God had broken their enemy's power and that God was going to deliver their enemies into their hands. And so while the, enemy, the enemy's presence remained, the Israelites were empowered to go out and to take ground through the power of God. And yet, as we've seen, they don't do that. They don't do that. They don't, they, they don't actually battle these enemies. They, they allow their presence to stay in their land. And as a result, they never experience the fullness of of all that God had won for them. And friends, part of the book of Judges is God telling us he has not wants to fall into that same trap. I wonder who here has sinned that you have accepted as a part of your life. And today, Christ is inviting you to know more of his life. He, he, he wants to remove the shame of that sin. He wants to remind you that you are forgiven, that you are loved, that his blood cleanses you. Yes, you are welcomed to heaven. Yes, you are his beloved child. Absolutely. But that's only part of the good news. The whole good news is that the, the grace that forgives us in Christ is also power for us in Christ. And we empty the cross of its power when we forget that the cross led to a resurrection. And that the very power that raised Christ from the grave is the power that's now at work in us to empower us to live lives of righteousness for our good and God's glory. And so listen, God wants us to be empowered to fight our sin. To be empowered to believe in what he's already done for us in Christ. That doesn't mean that we will not be tempted. right? God can sometimes miraculously remove temptation from people's lives. That, that can happen sometimes, but it really is a miracle. That, that is not the normal expectation that we should have as Christians. Because far more than just giving deliverance to us, God wants to work dependency in us. And so most commonly, he allows the presence of sin to stay in our lives, not so that we keep giving into it, but so that we can learn to lean on him. We can learn to trust him. And we can learn to depend on him in order to resist the pool of sin. And in doing so, we can experience his power at work in our lives as he leads us into the rest and satisfaction of following Christ. And so if you feel the persistent pool of your sin, in other words, if you're a human like the rest of us here, if you feel the persistent pool of your sin, don't be discouraged. And don't believe for a moment that means you're defeated. No, what that means is that you are dependent. You need Christ. I need Christ. And the good news is that we have Christ. And so tomorrow, when you are tempted to lie again, or tempted to sin in anger again, or tempted to lust again, or tempted to fear when you know, what, what others think of you again, or tempted to live for and chase the things of the world again, whatever your battle is, whatever your again is, for me, it can be a struggle that, that I face a lot with sinning in my anger, just, just keeping it real. If you're new to this church, you're not pastored by a, a perfect pastor. You're pastored by a needy pastor who needs Christ. But what I need to remember, what you need to remember, is that when we're faced with our sin, when I'm faced with those moments where I feel like, man, there's an emotion in me that's going to provoke some, some words to come out of me that do not honor God. I need to be remembered when I'm tempted to lash out 
because of Christ. And because that there's no sin that I face that he is not already beaten. Because of Christ, here's what I can cry out. God, fill me with your resurrection power. And help me to believe in the victory that Jesus has won. And through faith in you, empower me to stop what I'm about to say. And experience the goodness of being patient and kind like you want me to be. And while I'm not perfect in doing that, while I'm still not all of who I should be, I thank God that through his power, I'm not who I used to be. We are pilgrims who can, through Christ, make progress. We are to be making progress because we have a Savior who is powerful. And it is a weak, diluted, and most importantly, an unbiblical view of the gospel if we think that Jesus only forgives us and don't believe that he can increasingly change us. Thank God that he welcomes us to come to him as we are. But praise the Lord, he does not leave us as we are, but he wants to work more of his power in us so that while we will never be sinless, we can by his grace learn to sin less and experience more of the goodness of who he is. Our judge is still alive, friends. And so we are to look to him and walk in the victory that he has won for us. And so as we come to a close, let me try to bring this point home by telling you a true story. There was a woman named Annette who came into some money, and in an act of kindness, she decided to buy her mother a new mattress. Her mom's mattress had been around for decades, and it was old and raggedy and lumpy. And so she decided to surprise her mother, and she threw out the old blank, the old mattress while her mother was at work and bought a new mattress and, you know, installed it in the house. And she's just waiting there, excited for her mom to come home. When her mother came home, when her mother saw what her daughter had done, she shrieked in horror. Because for years, that mother had been putting all of her money into that mattress. She hadn't been using a bank. She had been using that mattress as her bank. And that mattress contained all of her life savings from decades and decades of worth. And this is a true story. You can look this up. The mother had saved over $1 million in that mattress. And so they tried to recover it. But at that point, it was in some kind of landfill, and it was too late. And so the money that the mother had been sleeping on, she was never able to benefit from. I tell you that story to say this, friends, there is power in Christ that God does not want us to sleep on. God wants us to benefit from. And so I don't know what cycles you might feel stuck in, but I know that unlike these judges who died, we have a Savior who lives, and there is more saving power in Him than there is sin in us. And so if you believe that you can't change, then what you need is a bigger Savior, and the good news is that you have one in Christ. Don't sleep on the goodness of who he is for you. But take him out and spend some of the power that he has brought to bear in your life. Friends, we change not through greater effort. We change not through greater willpower. No, we change through a deepening awareness and deepening experience of his power is at work through our faith in him. And it's not the size of our faith that is our confidence. No, it's the strength of the one that we are to have faith in. Friends, God loves us so much that he wants us to walk in the goodness and sweetness of following him. He wants us to live in the goodness and fullness of all that he has for us in Christ. And so, Christ Church, let's not settle for half a gospel. Let's believe that the victory of Christ not only forgives us, but it also empowers us. Let's believe that by faith and walk forward in lives that give much glory to God. Let's bow our heads in prayer.